Welcome to the Backpacking Podcast, the only podcast where Jeremiah Stringer will admit that we're friends in public. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> welcome, welcome, I, I, welcome. I tremendously bring down your cool factor. No, dude, I this love is, you very much. Is, I appreciate that, man. It, it's good to have uh, friends that make you look even better than you already do. So uh, I'm glad I can, I can be that for you. I, I, like to, I like to do my part. I'm here for you, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So uh, today we got a pretty interesting topic to talk about, man. But before we even talk about that, dude, we got to go backpacking last week. Dude, that was so fun. Yeah. That's exactly what I needed. And I don't know when people are listening to this, but... If you're listening to it sometime, like in the near future after it's recorded. Right after they heard me slurp my coffee right there without thinking about it. <laughs> That's okay. Um, you, This may be old news to you at this point. I don't know. I'm sure that we're all sick, of, sick and tired of hearing it, depending on when you're listening to this. But we've been dealing with this pandemic, and um, being able to get out of the house and do something that you love is exactly what I needed. Yeah. Yeah, and there really weren't a lot of restrictions yet when we went out. No, there's so. some social distance and stuff going on, and don't gather in groups in, of ten or more. Yeah, I think so. I think but that's what it was. There were four of us, and we wouldn't even shake hands. No, we didn't. We we did yeah. a lot of elbow bumps, and we called it the kid and play, where we tapped feet together. Yeah, I got to meet um, the infamous Ben McMillan, and I still haven't been able to shake his hand. So I guess I'll email him a handshake here in a minute. So that's about all I can do. That's all we can do right now, man. That's all we can do. You know, funny thing happened in that trip. What happened? Well, we were, uh, you know, everybody had set up their stuff. I got there a little later than you guys because I actually had to work all day. So I had to get there a little later, which was a bummer. Scrub. I know, man. It was rough. But I, I got there and uh, set up my hammock and everything, which it was an off-trail trail that we were on. Yeah. And we knew nobody else was going to be out there that night. So I just set my my hammock across the trail because, <laughs> I mean, why not, you know? You were the last person I, I saw. Was, like, I was the last person there, yeah. Nobody else walked past. No, nobody. So I was like, oh, I figured nobody else is coming through here. So I said, it was a perfect spot because there was a nice, clean area <laughs> underneath, you know, my, my hammock. And it was pretty nice. But uh, the next morning, I got up and I promised you guys some bacon. Which was delicious. That was some <laughs> fat, thick bacon. That's some good bacon, wasn't it? So, so I, was, I was making the bacon. And I, I walked over to 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 uh, drain out some of the the grease so I could do the next little batch of it. When I came back, there were a lot of roots near where my hammock was. Okay. And I had my chair set up underneath my my tarp. I had it set in a porch mode so I could kind of just hang out like I had a front porch, you know. Nice. And uh, went to sit in my chair and I fell back into it and it broke. No, what chair? Snap the leg. It was the chair zero from Helinox. They're fragile, anyways, but. Uh, but yeah, it, it snapped the leg. And and so I, I got inspiration. And my inspiration was, what if we did a podcast on gear failure? <laughs> did you fall all the way down? Oh did man, you, you guys ground? were all still asleep. I, I hit the ground and I and I I heard it crack. And I was like, oh no. That's never a good situation. And I turned around, there it was. Now I did find out Jason Wall might still have other legs. From an old one of his that we'll talk about later. Um, That's so, a good story. So I might be getting those legs to use with what's left of my chair. So I may still have a chair zero when this is all said and done. So let's get this straight. You had a leg. I don't know if they're aluminum or what they're made of. Yeah, real light aluminum. You had a leg that bent or broke. I saw the the aftermath of this terrible crash. It to the bent ground. and broke. So... That's the situation, right? You sit down, sit down hard. Not, well, yeah, not really thinking. I, I literally tripped and fell into the chair. Oh, okay. I, I, I fell backwards I into that. the chair. That's what happened. It was like there were roots. <laughs> there were these roots right by where I was at. And so when I went to sit down, I tripped on one of the roots, and my whole body fell back. And when it did, it just caught that leg, and with all the force of my body, just snapped it. See, this is why I think it should be mandatory for everybody to carry one of those like ten dollar camping chairs. From Walmart on every backpacking trip. Yeah, they're only five pounds. Not a big deal. That should be a law. Yeah, but you're ultralight, so you can't. <laughs> I you wish. can't do that, man. You can't do that. Well, that's a great inspiration, J.K. And I think this is going to be a fantastic episode to talk about our gear, our gear failures. That's way too serious sounding for coming from you. I can't help that it, is, man. You sounded a like a teacher for a second. I'm a professional at my craft. You are. You are. True. Well, true professional. I think that we have a number of different gear failures 
different pieces of gear, different situations. So yeah. What do you want to start with? Let's talk about water filters. Oh, my gosh. Do you want to start or do you want me to start? Uh, I'll let you start. What happened to your water filter? Okay. When I when I was getting ready for the Shell Toy Trace, mm-hmm. you know, we talk about this a lot, and you talk about the long trail a lot. Those are the two big trails that we've done. Yeah. Um, I didn't know anything about water filters. So I watched videos like I always do. Mm-hmm. And I was watching a Darwin video, and he showed this little tiny filter by a company called Hydro Blue. And then I watched this other guy, Devin, who like sang the praises of this little filter by a company called Hydro Blue. Mm-hmm. It's the size of the Sawyer, the Sawyer Mini, not the Sawyer Micro, but the Sawyer Mini, That's same small. size as that. So it was lighter in weight than the typical Sawyer, which is only three ounces or two and a half ounces or something like that anyways. But uh, it was a little bit lighter and I was kind of being a gram weenie because I wanted to have my weight really light, you know, for this trip. And, and so uh, I went and ordered one. They were cheap. It was like, I might have been like $17 for this water filter. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, it's a whole lot cheaper and it weighs less. It's kind of a no brainer. And the flow rate was supposed to be better than the mini, but not quite as good as the squeeze. That's a, that would so, be a good happy medium. Yeah, it's a happy medium. So it seemed like a really good purchase. So I got it. And for the first 100 miles of the Shell Toy Trace, it worked really well. Mm-hmm. And then it didn't. At all? I back flushed it every day. At the end of the day, I would back flush it like they tell you to. And that one's not like the the Sawyer where you have to use the plunger. Yeah. This one, you just hook your bottle to the other side with the clean water and just squeeze it through, and it would back flush it for you. Okay. So I did that at the end of each day just to make sure I was cleaning out all the garbage and debris and stuff inside my filter. Mm-hmm. And uh, we uh, – I can't remember where – we might have been near – it was just before we were hitting Yamacraw in the Big South Fork. It's my neck of the woods. Right in your neck of the woods. And – my buddy, the Flash, had his Sawyer squeeze. I had my my my, my uh, Hydro Blue, and I could not get hardly a trickle to come out of that filter. I've been there, and it just nothing would happen. And and I ended up we ended up getting off the trail because um, we had done two weeks, so we had gotten off the trail, and I immediately went to Walmart and bought a Sawyer squeeze the full the full the full Sawyer squeeze and I've never looked back since and unless somebody comes out with something that is proven over hundreds and thousands of miles of other <laughs> hikers that it can last and it can keep the flow rate I'm not touching the Catadyne I'm never touching the Micro I'm not getting a mint I am sticking with the Sawyer squeeze and I'm not touching anything else there's a lot of people in the same boat as you I think yeah so tell us your story <clears throat> well it's a couple tied into one, I think. <coughs> I I went with the Sawyer Squeeze first. And I was like, okay, $30 with accessories. You can do gravity system, blah, blah, blah. I'm down. Yeah. And then I also, no, I actually, I think I bought the Mini first. The Mini before I ever bought any other filter. And I was like, man, this thing is really slow. I've heard good things about the Sawyer Squeeze. This is before I've done any YouTube or anything like that. Yeah. I've heard really good things about the squeeze, and my father-in-law had used it on my first trip whenever I had the mini. And um, It seemed like he was getting faster water than you were. Oh, he definitely was. So I was like, well, I've heard all this good stuff, and I've seen it in person. I'm going to buy one. So I bought one, and it worked well. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to do this through hike. And weight really does matter when you're doing a through hike because, as I've said many times, the less all your stuff weighs, the more food you can carry. That's that's the reality. It's always about food for you, isn't it? It's the reality of the situation. Always about the food. So if we're being honest, food is the most important thing in my life. So I had to take more food, <laughs> so I'm trying to get rid of this weight, right? There you go, man. You're actually not trying to get rid of weight. <laughs> I'm trying to. You're get trying rid of- to reappropriate the weight. Yes, you're like, right. You're trying to. You're trying to. To uh, shift the weight, so to speak. Yeah, shift it in my favor so I can eat more. That's <laughs> pound of chocolate, right? Pounds. Pounds, Pounds of, chocolate. of chocolate. So anyway, I say I will spend an additional $20 on a Sawyer Micro to save the ounce so I can, I don't know, take a couple of extra packets of coffee or something, right? It's basically no weight savings. Yeah. 
Well, I do that, and I use the micro for Sawyer on just like weekend trips and stuff. And I think that thing would be great if you go out three or four times a year, right? But if you're going out every weekend or you're doing like... Can I tell you something real quick? Yeah. If you're ever drinking coffee, don't try and breathe it in. It's a bad call. <laughs> did you huff that coffee? Dude, I just drank that coffee, but it it did not go down the right thing. I think you and did. I think I almost just drowned in coffee just now. Like I, you almost saw my dead body just fall over limp from drowning in coffee. They say it only takes two, like two tablespoons of water. Like a tablespoon. Take, yeah. I wonder how much coffee it takes. Man, I, that might've been a gallon. I don't know. But if, if Josh Ebersol, if you're listening right now, I just want you to know we're having genuine Jamaican Blue Mountain coffee today. And this is like the hardcore good stuff that I actually got it from Jamaica. So just a big shout out to Josh because he is the coffee snob guy you know, of, of a lot of us backpacking YouTubers. And, uh, yeah, he's also got a podcast too, where he, he talks about, about coffee, coffee and yeah. backpacking. Yeah. Good guy. Good guy. Anyway, sorry about that. I just, if you heard me going to a coughing fit, it is not COVID. I <laughs> literally just about drowned in coffee just now. So, <laughs> well, with the micro, <clears throat> like I was saying, it's good. If you're just going on like weekends, maybe you go out once every two or three months. Right. And if you're going to spend twenty dollars on a water filter every year, that's not very much money. Like a couple, of, <laughs> you know, a couple of packs of water is like ten bucks. Right. So what happens is I get out and like two days in, the micro is like you're squeezing it with everything you got, and you're probably going to pop one of those bladders that comes with it if you keep squeezing with the force that it takes to push the water through the micro. Right. So I meet Caveman on this through hike, and he has a uh, Catadine Beefery with a one-liter bladder that attaches to it. And I was like, dude, your flow rate is insane. That thing is like a faucet. What would it take to let me use yours? And he's like, here you go, man. You can use it. And then I thought, maybe I'll never see him again. But it, we ended up hiking together for like the next three weeks, and I kept using his. And it got to the point where I was like, "Dude, if you'll just let me use it, I'll I'll, I'll filter all your water for you, please, please." You, you were that guy, dude. When you ever listen to this, <laughs> listen to how ridiculous this is. Before I met him, I my micro was sucking. Right, it wasn't very good. Right, and I was at a a place to resupply. I go into town, don't have time to shower, just have time to do laundry and buy more food and while my laundry's um, going i go into this backpacking shop or like outdoor store or whatever little mom and pop place tight and they had a um a hiker box in there and there was a full-size squeeze and you may have already heard this story if you have i'm sorry they had a full-size squeeze in there and i was like the probably the reason why this saw your squeeze is in that box is it's having the same issues mine's having so i didn't touch it I was like, I'm just going to keep using my micro, and whenever I get to a resupply, uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll buy me one, but I don't want to chance it. I don't want to be in a worse situation. In hindsight, I should have just tested it on the spot. It can't hurt to, like, trade out. Well, you could have put the micro in there and grabbed the Sawyer, and you wouldn't have been hurting. Look, dude, I'm not a very smart guy, and so that was a <laughs> terrible decision. So, like, two days later, or maybe even the next day, I meet Caveman, and guess what he tells me? What's that? Hey, dude, um, I know you're having problems with your filter. I wish I would have known. Like, I just bought the Catadine Bee Free just because I wanted to try it. Um, I actually dropped my Sawyer Squeeze. So it was a perfectly good Sawyer Squeeze? He said he put it in the hiker box at the <laughs> place where I was, rec like, going into shop. And he was like, you should have just taken it, man, because there was not an issue with that. I had, I had bought that, like, at the end of my through hike on the AT last year. Zero problems. I just wanted to try something new. You know, I'd hike for 2,000 miles with this same type of filter. Let me just try something new, change it up. So there was absolutely nothing oh, wrong with man. it. man. Freaking gear filters. And Tim Watson, he, I think he is still under the opinion that the micro, it's all just like make-believe that I it's a problem. I saw that in a video, yeah. He was, he was saying it's actually, he said he couldn't understand why people didn't like this thing. I'm telling you, Tim. Tim, are I'm you listening? You, we, Tim, still, we still don't know each other, but Tim... Tim, listen, listen very close. I'm telling you, I think you're making a mistake, man. I know his video's a little older now, but please don't buy the Sawyer Micro. That thing 
it is terrible. And Sawyer messaged me, and they said, do this, this, and this. I tried it. It didn't work. And they wouldn't give me another one. And I said, come on, bro. Not standing behind your product, man. That's not a good thing. But they can still sponsor me if they want. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't send me the micro. I want the full size. I'll still sell my soul to you. Just yes. don't, don't give me another micro. Exactly. Well, what other gear filters, uh, gear failures do we got? Oh, man. Hiking poles. You ever had oh, a hiking yeah. pole fail on you? Yeah, I, like trekking poles? Yeah. Yes, I have. I'm sure you have, or you wouldn't have brought it up. Yeah, what I want to hear yours, though. I didn't know you had you had that happen. Okay, well, trekking poles, I've had them to like kind of bend and warp on me. I never had them to snap. I remember one time I was climbing down. It's like a three or four foot little drop between rocks, and I'm like, okay, I got all this food in my backpack. It's really heavy. I'm going to try not to jump off this rock and break my knees. So I'm going to lower myself down with my pole. And then I slip getting down, and it, like, warps oh, the, yeah. the pole. Bent it. Mm-hmm. And so they're, like, harder to slide together. And another thing, if you're in an area that's sandy, if you have the sliding trekking poles, which, I mean, pretty much all of them are at this mm-hmm. point, yeah, that grit gets in there. I don't care how much you wash it, like, however you clean it, it scratches the surface up and just makes it so rough and so much friction that it's super hard. Like, you got to crank on it. To extend them out. Yep. And the last thing I'll mention about the trekking poles, this wasn't my gear failure, but I know somebody had a gear failure because I was doing this little like 14 or 15 mile loop on a solo and I come up and it was probably, I don't know, four miles to where I was parked and I sat down and I ate myself a PB&J and then uh, I get up to leave and somebody's aluminum trekking pole, like the outdoor, whatever the Walmart brand is. Yeah completely snapped and <laughs> they like you i saw one piece that had snapped and then i guess they got tired of carrying it because like 200 yards later there was the other half of it oh man so i carried it out they, i just they obviously don't understand leave no trace no they don't i Jerks. carried it out for them and i took the little stopper off the end to keep myself if you're listening right now and that was your trekking pole you should be ashamed of yourself shame 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 shame, shame them it's terrible terrible what, what happened to your trekking poles okay Are, we're looking at them right now actually i've got them right here these were the first trekking poles I ever got. They were Mountain Smith Pinnacle trekking poles. I bought them because they were 35 bucks for the pair. Yeah, Mountain Smith's and a I, cheaper, like not cheaper, but budget brand, right? Yeah, more of a budget brand. Um, I got these from Sportsman's Warehouse. And they're the, they're the twist locks, which... Um, I'm not a fan, man. Yeah, I didn't know any better at the time. So you can see where, they, where I was using them to. There's a line right there. But... Um, I got these out one day in cold weather, and I could not loosen the locks. I just everything I did, I could not loosen the locks, mm-hmm. and so I I worked it, worked it, worked it, and finally it loosened up. But then it, I pulled too hard because I was trying so hard. It pulled the the pole completely out from the the bottom the bottom pole from the top pole, and there's like a spring hanging out and stuff, and I couldn't get it pushed back in. I do that all the time. Pull one. Mine doesn't have a spring, but, but it I, pops I, out. I couldn't get it pushed back in, and so I had this worthless thing that's just hanging out and flopping all over the place. <laughs> What'd you do? And I had to carry it for two miles like that. Ah. Uh, I mean, what? I mean, I couldn't. It wouldn't fit in my backpack or anything. It was like the way it was. It just, it was connected, but it wasn't connected. Uh, I saw Syntax seventy seven. That kind of happened to him with the ones that's got the cord. Yeah, and it was and it was before I did videos or anything, so I obviously wasn't videoing it. But I just remember being angry. Because well, yeah. I was out, at, I was out at the Red River Gorge, hiking by myself, and I was actually training for Kilimanjaro at the time. Yeah, and yeah, so I, the next day I was at J and H, our uh, outfitter in Lexington, and I bought a pair of uh, black diamonds, and those black diamonds have been awesome, and they have flick locks. It's a good brand. And I will only buy flick lock, trekking poles from here on out. I don't like that twist action. I, I'm not a twist fan. They just don't work for me, and and if they get stuck, they get stuck. You yeah. talk about difficult, do sand with these things. Not only do they have trouble pushing <laughs> in and out, but you have trouble twisting them too, so you're just really, mm. really stuck. So, And these slip sometimes too. Because oh, if you get it yeah. stuck in a rock and you twist the, the pole to pull it out of the rock, mm-hmm. it would actually twist the lock, loosen it up, and the whole thing's all janky. So you're talking about the alternative is the ones that it opens up and you can tighten a screw that's got like a little 
twist well, yeah, it's on literally it. a flick on it. You yeah. just you flick the it's a flick lock basically. Yeah. Yeah. And then you snap it back and it puts pressure on it. Yeah. There's no slipping. No it, slipping. As long as you have it tightened up. Yeah. I've had them to slip. Well, my my uh, black diamonds I've never had to tighten up. Ever. Really? They're not made that way anyways, the way these are. Oh, they and clip in. They and just and click right into place every time. Mm. And I've been using them since 2016, so almost four years, and I've had no problems. Do you, have you ever had these little rubber tips that go on the bottom to, to like, come off while you're hiking? Because I've seen, I saw, I like, four never of used, these. I never used the rubber tips. I don't either, and I don't even know why I kept that one. But mine is a nub on the bottom yeah. of the trekking pole. Yep. I need to replace, but I can't. I thought you could just replace the little graphite tip. Well, you replace the whole tip, the whole thing. The whole oh. Shaft. That whole thing comes out. Man, I don't know if mine does or not. Maybe mine's just cheap. Maybe. <laughs> Got the Cascade Mountain tick. So, yeah, that was a huge fail. It was pretty frustrating. Um, another fail I've had was with my uh, my tarp for my hammock, actually. Mm. And I think I showed this to you the last time we went out. Maybe I showed you or I showed Jason Wall. I can't remember which one. But I've got the wrong gauge of guy line. Oh, yeah, you showed me because it was slipping. It, it, it slips out when there's too much pressure or too much wind. Um, and the first time I really dealt with it was on top of the Red River Gorge. Uh, it was the night before you guys went out. There was mm-hmm. a group of you guys that went out there, and I could I was going to go with you originally, but I couldn't. Yeah. So I went the night before and spent the night. I remember that. And, uh, man, I'm, it was crazy wind up on top of Hanson's Point. And just crazy wind kept going, kept going. I couldn't do anything about it. And I remember the, uh, uh, it was probably about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. I was in my hammock and all of a sudden I saw my, my tarp made a noise and then it was on my bug net above my head. Oh, and I look over on the other side's flopping. That's the work in the wind. Mm-hmm. That's a bad situation. And so I got out and I tightened it back up and 10 minutes later, it's doing it again. Did you do that all night? Uh, I got tired of doing it and I just dealt with it and fell asleep. Man, I'm telling you, you could like, sometimes you got jerry rig stuff. My idea was to, like to take the line and just tie a knot, tie a knot on both sides and hook it. And then you can't tighten it. Like wherever you put the stake down yeah. is where it's going to stay, but it's better than nothing, I guess. Well, it, it, it kept me covered. I mean, there was no rain oh, that yeah. night. It was just wind. Yeah. It was just wind. So I wasn't, if it'd been rain, oh, I'd have figured something out. Real yeah. quick. Sometimes but, wind is bad. It make you a little cold where it's sucking that heat yeah. if your tarp's not pitched. But that was a really unseasonably warm night. The low oh. was like 62. Did you have your uh, really warm underquilt? Oh, man. I had like, what did I use? I had, I had a 15-degree underquilt, but my top quilt was like a 20-degree top quilt. And I, I bet was, you were warm. See, I was fine. Like, I wasn't even like, I wasn't sweating it at all. I but that was frustrating. I had, I wouldn't call it gear failure. I'd call it a user failure. Because the first time I set my tarp up, it's got the doors, oh my gosh, pitched completely wrong. <laughs> and I tried the, like I got the pullouts on mine. Right. And um, it's the ones where you can do the pole mod, and it basically opens it up kind of like a tent under it, mm-hmm. if you imagine. And I did not know how to do that. It's all saggy, and the doors would not close. They don't overlap at all. They're supposed to. Right. But I had it pitched completely wrong. Well, and I've got the pull mods on mine. Yeah, yours do it right. Yeah. I, mine I, does I've too got the if you do it. Mine. Yeah. But I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. Still have no idea. I don't know why anybody listens to anything I say. I got no idea. <laughs> it's because you're so charming when you say <laughs> That's it. What That's it what it is. So I got a tent failure <laughs> since we're speaking of shelters. I don't know. Do you have any tent failures you've ever experienced? Honestly, not really. I guess. Um, I pitched I pitched my my Fly Creek wrong one night on the Sheltoe. Um, we had hiked the whole day from the southern terminus up, and there hadn't been any rain, mm-hmm. but we knew it was coming, and it wasn't just going to be light; it was going to be big. And so um, we hiked past the bridge. It goes over. I don't think it's the Cumberland River, but uh, it goes over a river. Got across the bridge, and we were like, we probably better find a place to camp real soon. <laughs> Rain's closing in. And just as we set our stuff down to start setting our tents up, deluge. And we just got poured on as we were setting our tents up. So, and if you know anything about setting up a tent like like that has an inner and then you set the other, the outer on top of it, Uh-oh. my stuff was soaked. It's the whole inside of the tent, yeah. the whole the whole inside of the tent was soaked because there was no getting out getting around it. Only thing you can do is be quick. Yeah. And so I got it set up as quick as I could, but I didn't really stake it out well. 
because I was doing it so fast. Yeah. And in the middle of the night, one of the, the way the, the fly creek is, it's a semi freestanding. Gotcha. So one side, the poles are holding two ends down. Then it's just a single pole in the back. Mm-hmm. And then you stake out the ends. And uh, one of those stakes came loose. And it just the full corner just sagged in. Uh, did it get you wet more? Well, I was going to, yeah, there was no getting around wet at that point. Like, it, it was one of those things where, um, one, it was like 80 during the day. Yeah. Two, the inside of the tent was already wet. And then three, because of the rain hitting the tent, it cooled down the outside of the tent really fast. So it's super hot inside the tent, super cold on the outside of the tent. And so I had water, like, raining on me all night. Every time every time a raindrop would hit the tent, uh-huh. I would get sprayed. Oh, because of the inside. Because the, the inside was wet, and so I was get. I'm basically I was sleeping in a mist the entire night. Man, that's the worst. Yeah, I'm really glad it didn't destroy everything I had, but um, there were some casualties of my equipment <laughs> during that time. <laughs> well, my tent. So I bought this North Face Triarch Three at an REI garage sale, which I is that the Palace? That is. Yeah, I'm trying to think of all kinds of different names. Synagogue, the, synagogue. the palace, synagogue. the mansion. People call it different things. I haven't heard the synagogue. That's <laughs> hilarious. It's my Jewish tent. So, it's a it's a three person tent. So my wife and I fit very well in there. And there's even space, you know, on either side or between us with two long wide X light pads. And it's really comfortable in that tent. I've slept in that tent. <sighs> yeah. Without me. I slept yeah. in your fly creek that you're just right. talking about. It's tight in there. <laughs> it is when you're it is when you're six foot three. <laughs> <laughs> well, this tent in particular, I bought it at REI Garage sale, which I would highly recommend hitting those up. Yeah, absolutely. You can get some steals there. Just, Don't actually steal anything, but I just you gotta can steal get some on steals. a chair. Yes. The, See, the chair what? the chair that broke. Yeah. I needed to replace it. Obviously, and but I didn't have a lot of money because my our spending money isn't huge. Yeah, and uh, but luckily uh, I was able to find one that was under my spending money. So you can find really good deals. That. Yeah. Well, I bought this, and the seam tape was coming undone under the rain fly because oh, wow. it's it's a fully freestanding tent and it's heavy. Yeah, it is. Relatively heavy. It's like five and a half pounds, which for two people is not that huge of a deal. But for one person, when they're also carrying a Lunar Solo. I know. <laughs> I sent you with... <laughs> if anybody wants to see a funny video, go on JK's channel and watch his gear swap video because we swap gear, and that's when he slept in my tent, and I may have snuck an extra tent in there. His own may have. I might have. It's an accident, dude. That he, tent's small. I forgot it's in there. He said accident. He laughed at me the whole time it's when I was accident. pulling stuff out of that backpack. So, <laughs> Well, anyway, <coughs> I buy this. I actually called North Face while I was standing in REI looking at the tent, and I said, hey, will you all repair this? And they said, yep, if you'll pay to ship us the rain fly, which goes on the outside, and then the inner is freestanding then we'll we'll send it back to you fixed for free. And I actually had to send it to them twice. That's incredible. I know. North Face standing by their uh, their gear. Even it's like though, Osprey. And I would, yeah, Osprey's excellent too. They've repaired stuff for me. So those REI garage sales, like you could buy, you know, something that's busted up and the gear companies a lot of times will fix it. Like you could buy Osprey pack completely blown out. They'll fix it for free. Mm-hmm. But anyway. For life too. I digress. It doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter how long you've owned the backpack. No. And you or if be, you got it used. Yeah. It doesn't matter. If the backpack has a hole in it, you get a new backpack. Mm-hmm. Or they'll repair it. Or they'll repair it. Yeah, if it's repairable. Yeah. So I buy it, I send it off, get it back, and then I take it on this Foothills Trail through Hike with my wife and what we call our adventure buddies, Kristen and Kevin. Yeah, I've seen that video. So we had a, a fantastic time, except we had this gear failure of the tent. See, the tent has this rain fly, the one that I got repaired, said rain fly. The zipper, so it has vestibules on each side. The vestibules? Zipper, not vegetables, <laughs> vestibules. You mean vestibules? That's what I said, man, you said, you vestibules. Like, you said vestibules. <laughs> Sorry, man, that's racist. That's I can't help racist. that I have an accent. It's not an accent. You're you, racist. You pronounced an S like a sh. Well, I don't know what to tell you, man. I got an accent. Why are you laughing, dude? <laughs> <laughs> it's a vegetable. It is not a vegetable. I didn't say vegetable. It sounds closer to vegetable than vestibule. Ve- vestibule. 
vestibule. <laughs> it's got one on each side, man. There's no H in it, man. You are extremely racist. I am not racist. Yes, you are. Oh, dude, that's funny. I'm telling you. Okay, so tell me about the vestibule. <laughs> that's that's why you say it. It is not the way you say it. <laughs> Go ahead, tell us the story. Oh. I'm dying here right now. <laughs> You're killing me. Oh, man, it's cracking me up right now. I'm almost crying. I'm laughing so hard. <laughs> so, anyway, there's one of these on each side. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to hide myself. I'm not expecting you to. <laughs> Just keep talking about your vestibule. <laughs> vestibule. <laughs> we need to start a counter for this or something. So, anyway, what I was saying was, you can get out on either side. Right. And they both have a zipper that you tie out with a stake. Right. And then you pull tension on it. Well, that zipper completely busted and didn't work at all. Oh, like one no. side's completely out. The fabric where it's sewn together, where the zipper's supposed to stop, was ripped. And then the zipper slid off. One zipper I actually lost, gone forever. And what stinks about that is it's almost worse than the tape being bad. Because yeah, yeah, bugs yeah. can get in. Yeah. And bugs are worse than wet, well, I it, think. It was only the rain fly part. It wasn't the actual inside the tent. Oh, okay. Well, that's cool. So yeah. it's just a, like a tie out. Okay. So, that's not as big of a deal. Yeah. But it is a big deal whenever you're out there for like five or six days straight. Oh, yeah. And you can never tie it out right. And not only that, you got two people and you want to get out on either side because if Bridget and I are going together, she always gets up in the middle of the night because she can't use a pee bottle. Right. And I can. So, you use a pee bottle in the tent with your wife? Well, yeah, dude. And then I hand it to her. So it's like a hot water bottle. Oh, dude. I. <laughs> we love each other, man. I can't help it. I, I do. I love my wife, too. And that's why you I would need to get never. That's your why wife. I would never use a pee bottle in the tent with my wife laying there. Obvious. I can give you some counseling, man. That is not, that's not a counseling thing. That's just gross. I've been married for a few years now. <laughs> I got your back. <laughs> what? I've been married for a few years. I know all the answers. I get, look, you all be, you'll be handing her your pee bottle. <laughs> what, man? Anyway, what I'm saying is, I don't want her to wake me up whenever she gets up to pee. Right, right. But she usually does anyway because she's scared. Hey, Jeremiah, <laughs> I'm going to step outside for a second. Bridget, it's 3 a.m. I got to pee. You just listen for anything. All right, all right, baby. That's awesome. So... <laughs> Yep, now we were crawling over each other because you we had to stake it to the place where the zipper so, would end. So let me ask you this. Which side? Was it your side or her side? It, it, depend, it depends on the knot because we don't have set because sides. Because what happens if it, if it was on her side and she has to get out on your side and you're, she doesn't realize that you're using the pee bottle and she crawls over you? Oh, man, I wasn't even thinking about that. See, I should probably... See that, again, the pee bottle is a problem. No, it's not. It's See, a that, solution, that's, that's actually. A, that's a problem because if she if she didn't realize you were using it, crawled over you and knocked you sideways, you could pee all over the inside of your tent, and then you've got a real issue. Well, I'm peeing inside the sleeping bag. That's even worse. <laughs> no, we'd probably because you're not man. you're not getting a sleeping bag the rest of the week. Yeah, that's that true. That would smell terrible. It, you'd, it, have it terrible you'd have to leave that thing outside. You'd have to leave that thing outside every night. Man, it was below freezing. I think I'd freeze to death. Yeah, I see. You're, you're life or death, man. Is man, a pee bottle worth life or death? It's a comfort. <laughs> it's a comfort, man. <laughs> so that was my tent story. It got you. Right? That was my you. tent yeah. story. My tent failure. And North Face fixed that for free, too. That's awesome. But it does take like a couple weeks from the time you send it. And I did tell them, actually, whenever I bought that tent, I said, hey, North Face. I actually called them, <laughs> talked to somebody on the phone, asked them how I do it, and they showed me the form to fill out. And I said, North Face, look. I know your all's turnaround is like they got three to six weeks or something like that. I'm right. like, I'm going to do a through hike on the Foothills Trail in like two and a half weeks. Do you think you can get it back to me in time? They're like, yep. And so they rushed wow. it back. Wow. That was very, very impressive. Thank you, North Face. That is really cool, actually. And they repaired it a second time for free. That's they, impressive. They even paid the postage to send it in the second time to repair the zipper. Really? That was very good of them. Very good. That is very good. What other gear failures? Yeah, so I got this. I got real excited about this item that I bought uh, because I, I was trying to cut some weight. You know, I'm not. We've we've already discussed this. I'm not. I'm not an ultra light guy at all. Um, I'm definitely a lightweight backpacker. Now I think when in a few years when I try the John Muir, I'm probably gonna 
probably lean way more ultra light for that. Because, I mean, lots of elevation. Uh, it's a hard trail, man. 20 to 25 days of hiking. I'm going to want to pull back on the weight a little bit. Sure. Um, but for, for what I do typically, I'm not, I'm not big on that. But I wanted to drop some weight. And so I got my hands on the Ultra Pod 2 from Pedco. So when Darwin uses that's, I think. Uh, that's where I got the idea from was Darwin because he was taking it with him on his, uh, his uh, Appalachian Trail hike. And along the way, he was also getting this little newer thing, which I've got right here. It's a little clip that uh, allows you to use an Arca plate on your camera, and you don't have to screw it into the Pedco. You can actually just put this on top of the, the Ultra Pod and screw it in like you would a normal tripod. And just for Super clarification, that's like um, it's an accessory for the camera, so you can attach it to the outside of your backpack. Your average tripod uses what they call an Arca plate. Yeah. It's just a plate that screws into the bottom of the camera so that you can connect it to a tripod. And that's the pretty standard one for the average camera person, not like your professionals. Yeah. They have different kinds of plates that they use and everything, but the average person typically uses an Arca plate. Yeah, same size threads on all of them. Yeah. Universal. Yeah, so uh, I was real excited to get this out. I took it up with me to Wisconsin in February, first trip with it, and uh, I couldn't loosen the head of the tripod up. And so I just kind of played with it and just kind of did what I could with it for the trip. Um, I couldn't, the ball would never actually tighten up. It would just be loose the whole time and it would still move. Now, how do you, uh, it must have been impossible for you to like actually adjust it to where it it fits where you want it to properly while carrying it. And you can set the tripod up and you can do like selfie mode yeah, without was, being able to tighten it, up. It was, it was borderline nightmare actually. Yeah. And it was the first trip with it. So I, I was kind of shocked. I was like, man, cause I, I taught, I actually was on a backpacking YouTubers thread mm -hmm. and asked everybody, have any of you guys used these before? Cause I'm thinking about getting one and people who'd used the original one said that it's too small for a DSLR, but the two was made to be used with a DSLR. So it's longer. It's yeah. So it, it, it was a stronger thing and all this. Well, I get home and I've got to get it loosened up. I can't get this thing loosened up. And so I just grabbed some pliers to try and loosen it. Cause I couldn't grip it hard enough to get it loose because right, right. The size of your hand to the size of this little tiny knob is, is not much. Mm -hmm. So I twist it to loosen it and it snaps the screw. Made in China. Snaps the screw, man. And so, uh, it, luckily it wasn't super expensive. It wasn't like a, like an ultra pot or like a, uh, like, like a, a gorilla Joby pod, gorilla like, pod. yeah, like a gorilla pod 5k or something where it costs you almost a hundred bucks. Yeah. This was a fifteen or twelve dollar, I think is what I spent on it. Yeah, twelve dollar tripod, but it's an absolutely worthless piece of nothing now. <laughs> yeah, you can't so, really use it. There's this has no use for me anymore, and it's trash uh, man. It's just I, I, I'm holding it right here so you can see it. And the reason I, I want you to see is because I want you to see Jeremiah's. He's got one here, and it still works. So he's got a perfectly good one. And the way it works I don't. is. It only has one screw on it, and that controls, like, two locations. It yes. controls the camera swiveling, like, it's like a ball joint, and then it also controls... The uh, swing arm. Yeah. So, without being able to loosen and tighten that, you're really defeating two positions that, that have, like, a joint there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once those joints can't move, it's like if you were to, you know, straighten your leg out and couldn't move your leg. Like, yeah. your knee joint... You know, it's useless at that point. It's basically like a peg. Yep. Right? So, I don't know, man. I have, I took mine out, and I also used one. I met up with uh, Miyagi on the trail and um, Hunter's Trip, and then there were some other people there, too, like uh, Miyagi's wife and my wife. But we met up, and that was, a, you know, a trip to the gorge, and I tried out the UltraPod 2 before I actually bought it. And right. I also... Outland, Lance from Outland. Yeah. He's got a YouTube channel as well. He gave me a lot of information on it too. He's one of the guys I talk to. Mm hmm. So shout out to him for the information and showing me some accessories and stuff that would work. Thanks, Lance. My, my tripod broke. It's gone. My tripod <laughs> it's is gone. Fault. It's Lance's fault. I'm blaming Lance. <laughs> I'm kidding, we always, obviously. We've got to blame somebody else. Yeah. It's either Dan Becker's fault or Lance's fault. It's unfortunate. It's Dan's fault because he told me not to bring a chair. So. I'm just <laughs> That's a whole different podcast. You have to listen to last week, but 
I, it's unfortunate that it broke, man. But yeah. I will say, if people are going to buy it, because you may have gotten a lemon, I don't know. I would try to return it if you can. It was a day past the return date when I when it broke. Uh, I can't, I'm not even kidding. A day past it when it broke. Because I immediately got on Amazon to do a return. Yeah. And it said you're, <laughs> it ended and it was the date the day before. At least it's only 12 bucks. Man, that is a waste of money, though. I know um, my buddy Adam, Serial Photog, mm-hmm. he bought... Um, like a three hundred dollar tripod, I think he does a lot of photography. No, he does some great photography. Serial photog. So Adam Thompson. Yep. Yeah. And so he he does all kinds of great photography. He has an amazing Instagram channel or Instagram um, account that y'all should check out. Absolutely. But a tripod for him is a necessity. So dropping the big bucks on it sometimes worth it, especially if it's like a part time business that you're doing. Right. So. But then you also, bucks. but then you also have that risk of you're out in the woods, and anything can happen. You could trip over rock, fall, land on the tripod, uh, and it snaps. That would um, be the worst. Like anything can happen when you're out in the backcountry. In all you're, honesty, that's one of the most interesting parts about making the YouTube videos. Is like typically, if somebody's going to tell a story, it's going to have a beginning, middle, and end. Uh huh. Right, and you kind of script it out, and you know what shots you're going to um, film, and you know the storyline that you want to you want to push. With backpacking, you have no idea what's going to happen. None. It's one of the best parts about it. It really, it, it's an adventure, which exactly. is why, which is why we do it. Sometimes it's like you grind it out, and sometimes it's like these are stories you're going to tell your kids. And they are, and I think it's the failures and those mishaps that actually make it worth going. I agree. It's like that top two fun that Devin talked about. Yeah. Like it may not be, it may be a hardship in the moment, but when you look back, those are the stories. That you tell around the campfire. They are. It's like they the are. old joke. What, what do you talk about around the campfire? You talk about the last campfire you had. Like, that's the joy in it. Yeah, it's it's the story. It's the story. And even all this gear has failed, it gave us something to talk about. Look at that. It's so so great podcast today, man. Dude, I have fun. It's good talking with you. And I'm I'm really gonna um I'm gonna try and get a hold of a linguist for you to teach you how to oh say vestibule my correctly. Gosh. So. Vestibule. Vestibule. Oh my gosh. I can't help it, man. Well, that was the backpacking podcast <laughs> for this week. <laughs> it's been great being here, and uh, we look forward to checking you out next week. So until next time, have a good one. Adios. Adios.